Welcome to the American Theatre Wing Seminars on Working in the Theatre. These are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, located at 42nd Street, Times Square, the heart of the theatre, where Broadway, Off-Broadway, and Off-Off-Broadway all come together. And from that, they go across the country so that they give the best of New York. And from across the country, from the regional theatres and the university theatres, they send their best to New York to seed and cultivate the New York theater. These seminars are an outgrowth of the Wings School in which students coming back from the Second World War were able to go from one room to another to learn the art of what it was to work in the theater. From the viewpoint of the performer, the playwright, the director, the set designer, the costume designer, the Wing has done this now through these seminars in order to give you this insight into a behind-the-scenes look. And we also have the seminar on agents and on guilds and on unions so that you can tell more about the people that are working for and with the people who work in the theater. The Wing is known for its Tony Awards, and I'm justly proud of it. However, the award was named after a woman who was named Antoinette Perry, a strong believer in training for the theater. She was an, an actress, a producer, and a director. And this award, in her honor, is not given for the best box office, the longest run, or the most vociferous review that has ever been done, but it's because it the artists in the theater have achieved excellence in the craft of theater. And that's why we're doing these seminars. We're trying to tell you what it is to work in the theater. We're trying to develop the art and the craft of working in the theater. And everything that the wing does year-round, its many programs are aimed at just at that. That as well as serving the community through the theater. Our Saturday Morning for Children program does just that. It goes into schools, public schools on Saturday mornings, and children line up at the earliest age to see a live theater. We then go to an Introduction to Broadway program, which in its third season has brought 30,000 young people into the Broadway theater. And this is done in cooperation and the generosity of the producers, the Broadway producers, who have made available their tickets and the Board of Education of high schools in New York City have been able to line up schools and offer the tickets to the children. The youngsters pay a very minimum price for the ticket. To them, it's a fairly good price. But the important thing is that they pay to go to see a Broadway theater and a show. And what I think is so interesting is for a majority of them, they've never been to the theater, not a live professional theater. And yet the magic of that word theater is something that they want to see, even though they've been trained on television and movies. So we are developing, again, another audience, an important audience for the theater. The Wing also has a year-round program of going into hospitals and nursing homes and aid centers so that those who can't go to the theater get some part of that magic, and it's, it's a very exciting thing to be part of. And all of this we do with the cooperation of the theater industry. I am indeed proud to be president of an organization that can call on the people that we do and have them respond to the needs of the American Theater Wing and the theater and community. This seminar, which is one of the most interesting and exciting ones that we can possibly do and is the, at the root of, of theater, because it's the development of theater, it's an important one to bring to you. And um, it, it's called uh, Regional Theater and New Play Development. And it is exactly that. And it is being co-moderated by uh, Dasha Epstein, who is the vice president of the American Theater Wing. She's a producer of numerous Broadway and off-Broadway shows, including Same Time Next Year, and on to such wonderful, memorable shows as Children of a Lesser God and the Song of Jacob Zulu. And with her is George White, 
who is president of the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, who is a director at Yale University, and is a wonderful man for and with the theater. And when we talk about development, I think that we say George White, Eugene O'Neill Center. And I'm turning it over to you now. George, as a producer, I've traveled an awful lot of miles. I've listened to a lot of readings, and I've gone to a lot of off-Broadway, regional theater, workshops, some rough, some polished. And it's always been exciting to me to do all of that traveling. And I often think, where along the road, where does it start? Where does it go? But the thrill of finding a new work with all those miles that I've traveled is really exciting when you can find that piece and bring it on and develop it and watch it being developed. And then as a producer, bringing it further. Here we have a great group of people who make that happen. And since the show does go on the road, and that's where it starts, take it on the road, George. Start okay. It, and give us a little history. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start by introducing my side of the, of the panel, and then I'll, I'll uh, of who's here, and then you do, and then we'll, we'll, uh, I'll tell them a little bit about how the road evolved. So uh, uh, I'd like to start with uh, the uh, lady in the dark dress here, uh, uh, who is an old friend, and it's wonderful to see her here, is Lynn Meadow, who is one of the country's leading directors and producers of theater. She's been the artistic director of the Manhattan Theater Club since 1972. My Lord, is it there? Okay. Um, uh, and producing over 100 American and world premieres by American and international playwrights. She teaches at the Circle in the Square Theater at School and has taught at Yale University, New York University, and SUNY at Stony Brook. And on her left is Zakes Mokai, who is now appearing in the Song of Jacob Zulu, has performed in numerous theatrical productions on Broadway, off-Broadway, and throughout the world, uh, as well as in films. In addition to acting, he has a long list of director credits and is directing a directing fellow of the American Film Institute. Um, and uh, on my immediate right is a, uh, a lady I must say that I knew when she was uh, just beginning um, and is the wonderful uh, Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Wendy Wasserstein who is currently represented on Broadway uh, by the Lincoln Center Theater production of The Sisters Rosenzweig and in addition to her many contributions to Broadway and off-Broadway she has written screenplays for both film and television and is the author of several books it says here we really? can talk about that. Yes, right. <laughs> On the far left is uh, Howard Kissel. And when the name critic comes up, a lot of us sort of shake a little bit, but we're very, very, he's very, very good. And he is the theater critic for New York's Daily News. And to... <laughs> On his right is Dorothy Olam. In addition to producing a roster of off-Broadway plays and operating a general management firm, she was the first woman to be elected to the League of Advertising Agencies. The first woman to serve as secretary treasurer of the League of Off-Broadway Theater Owners and Producers, and the first to serve as secretary treasurer of ACPAM, the Association of Theatrical Press Agents and Managers, a national AFL-CIO union. To Dorothy's right is Ben Sprecher, co-owner of the Promenade Theater, Variety Arts Theater, and general manager of the Lucille Lortel Theater. Began, he began his theatrical career as a lighting designer for rock groups and as a stage manager for Broadway shows. He went on to become general manager of numerous Broadway and off-Broadway productions. <laughs> and on my left is a good friend. He's also a general manager for me, Albert Poland. He's wonderful. Currently represented by the Steppenwolf Theater Company, production of the Song of Jacob Zulu on Broadway. He began his career as a producer at age 24. Is that what you are now? <laughs> <laughs> With the first national touring company of the Fantastics. Primarily known as a general manager of off-Broadway production, he is the co-author, editor of the off-off-Broadway book, an anthology.
Well, now I, I, I will pick up on, on uh, taking the show on the road, uh, as Dasha mentioned. And, and I'd like to give perhaps a, a little bit of a history uh, for uh, some people who are, you know, under, let's say, 25, of which most of you are, um, about things before then. And in a sense, way, way back, even as, as, as early as the 1880s, uh, there was a road, and that road was in usually the, what we used to be called the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad that ran from uh, Boston to New York. And you tried out a play, and in those days it sort of started in Boston, came to Providence, even stopped in New London, Connecticut, uh, went into New Haven, and then came into New York, and a play was tried out along the way and evolved. And uh, even when I was growing up, the, the plays did open in New Haven. The, uh, a lot. There's the Schubert Theater that is still there, and, and as you go in the lobby, it says "Birthplace of the Nation's Greatest Hits," um, and uh, that shows either opened in New Haven or came into New Haven from Boston or Philadelphia and went on there. As uh, the time went on in the late '50s uh, and early '60s, Toronto got into the mix, Detroit got into the mix as part of the road. Somewhere along the line, and for a lot of economic reasons, primarily. The road, as we knew it, dried up, uh, and people could not afford to take a show out of town. All of the wonderful stories about terror, uh, terrifying evenings uh, and suites of, in the Taft Hotel in New Haven, where things were rewritten, people hiding behind potted palms when people brought in new, new writers, all of that kind of thing uh, began to die out, did die out. And uh, so there was a vacuum, and that vacuum began to uh, be filled by where you could get a play done uh, inexpensively, and that began to be filled by London for a while. So the road dried up as such, it became London. At the same time, uh, around, although uh, there were the beginning of the regional theatre movement, which uh, really began a little bit with uh, Nine Events and uh, Margot Jones in Texas, and uh, uh, Zelda Fitzhandler at the Arena Stage in Washington, and then Tony Guthrie as chewing Chicago for Minneapolis for a lot of reasons. Um, there was the beginning of that movement, and actually the only uh, person that was actually developing new work and doing it both here and in the country was a lady who's with us today, is Lucille Lortel, mm -hmm. who was the one woman who was doing the ongoing, which actually was the precursor to a lot of us who became heirs to, who are the children of Lucille Lortel, although she's uh, the same age and younger, we know that. Um, but anyway, uh, so there, were, there was that, and that was about the only movement. And finally, at, at the same, in, in the early 70s, and I think it was 72, but I may be wrong, there was a, uh, the first American uh, Congress of the Theater called FACT, which was uh, held in Princeton, New Jersey, and actually presented by uh, Alexander H. Cohen, and and the American Theater Wing. and the American Theater Wing, indeed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and the interesting thing is, Isabel, you remember about that, which was startling, in light of what's happened since. The antagonism and antipathy between the regional theater and Broadway was immense. There was a lot of fights, and people say, "Well, you people are doing commercial theater, and we're doing art." and never the twain shall meet. And there was a lot of heat, not a great deal of light at the, about those things, but a great deal of heat. Uh, and it's ironic that now, that many, my Lord, 20 years later, uh, things have changed. And the road has become, uh, in a sense, the regional theater. But something that uh, Dash and I talked about uh, earlier uh, is that plays, in a sense, are no longer tried out in the way that they were before, they become evolutionary. Plays now tend to evolve rather than are tried out, because the tryout in plays hit flop. Uh, whereas plays now tend to, people see things that are good in them, and they say, well, if we take it to the next step, uh, we can evolve the way a work is. And that's a very different thing from perhaps the days when there was a road. And then, well, there's more later. I would, that's, that's a quick, that five that's less than five, right. didn't you? I think, I think, George, also, um, as we were speaking before, and I'm sure all of you will agree, that once the show has evolved and comes, say, to Broadway or off-Broadway, in order for a show to go back to the road, 
it has had to gain some type of a great affirmation here in New York with a name star or with some kind of recognition to send it back on the road. So there really is a cyclical type of approach where it starts on the road, goes further, and then goes back on the road again. And should we start off? And Wendy, you've been a good traveler. Yeah, you, you've been <laughs> revolutionary <laughs> and evolutionary. How do you feel about yeah. About going on the road. On the well, road I mean, your experience of how, you know, your experience of, 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 of you've lived through this. I mean, yes, really I started. have. Well, in a different kind of way. I mean, in terms of place and being developed, I think the most important thing is every play dictates its own life. I, I do believe that, that all plays have a life of their own. And for me, what's been most important is my plays take a long time to develop, so what they need is having a home. And I've been very lucky in that the past 20 years or so, I worked with Andre Bishop at Playwrights Horizons, and then recently, over the past six years, with Dan Sullivan out in Seattle. So what happened, both with the Heidi Chronicles and the Sisters Rosenzweig, they were both first read uh, um, the Heidi Chronicles at Playwrights Horizons, Sisters Rosenzweig at uh, Lincoln Center, and we heard the play, and then I, we went and did a two-week workshop out in Seattle, which was just the actors rehearsing for two weeks, and then they did a staged reading carrying the scripts with them for three days in Seattle. Um, I did that for going to Seattle, one, because it's very far away from New York. <laughs> and the other thing is, I think specifically with my plays, there's always the question, oh, do you think it's too New York? Will people not understand this outside of New York? Because people don't have three sisters outside of New York. <laughs> so, <laughs> but actually, it's extremely helpful in terms of dealing with the audience. The other thing is, in a workshop situation, you're not worried about oh, well, we've got to get a name into this and, you know, worrying about the commercial life of the play. You're really dealing with the text of the play. And to me, that's most important, and concentrating on that, not even the technical aspects of it. I remember in the Heidi Chronicles, there was a scene that took place outside the Chicago Art Institute in the rain. And Dan Sullivan would say to me, how do you expect us to do this? And I said, well, I don't know. It doesn't have to rain here. We'll worry about it when it moves again. But um, what I would, you, we would have that workshop, and then I would rewrite the play again, have yet another reading of the play, uh, rewrite it again, and then go into rehearsal in New York. So that's a long process uh, on developing a play and really concentrating on the text. But um, I find incredibly useful. I would be terrified, actually, to just open a play in New York, which is actually what Terrence McNally does at Manhattan Theatre Club, which has always fascinated me, mm -hmm. how he's able to do that. But maybe it's because you've provided him with such a home yeah, there. Talk about that, Lit. I mean, because, you know, the old adage is plays, plays are not written, they're rewritten. Mm -hmm. But uh, you've done remarkable things at, at MTC uh, with people like Terry who... But that's also, I think, your guiding hand. But go into that a little but bit. But I, I don't think that um, Terrence, the evolution of Terrence's play is without rewrites. His plays are rewritten. It's, they're done in a shorter period of time. And I think what Terrence thrives on, and that some writers do thrive on and, and others need a different kind of um, span, is having a deadline and knowing that he's aiming toward an opening night on a certain date. And he writes toward that. Um, I think there there certainly are plays of his, though, that have evolved over a long period of time. One of the the first play of his, in fact, that we did was a play called It's Only a Play, and that had many incarnations through many different theaters, I think both out of the um, New York City um, and in New York City as well. So that was a play that took a lot of on-the-road work, as it were. And now that he's found a lexicon, uh, actors he's comfortable with, and well, home is, mm -hmm. is that's those are the words that Terence uses of what he needs in order to work in a uh, a way that's most valuable for him. So, I, but I think each writer is different. Yeah. That has served Terence very well. Other writers have wanted to work on things in in different ways. How do you, Lynn, go about finding these properties? And what has happened now? I know you have a subscription, and I depend upon that subscription to keep Manhattan Theatre Club mm -hmm. in good stead. Mm -hmm. And now with funding being eliminated by the National Endowment of Arts, where do you go and how do you handle your financing and your selection also of your properties? Um, well, that's sort of a two-part question. One, how do we find the plays? And two, how do we deal right. with the financing? 
um, the issue of theaters being financed is a whole other seminar, probably, <laughs> about how it is that we figure out ways to make ends meet. And I, um, I, I think, however, to the extent that we're talking about evolution here, we are talking about increasing marriages between the nonprofit theater and the profit theater. And that we've watched plays in many theaters and Wendy's plays are certainly a good example. Many plays that have originated at my theater and, and other theaters uh, that begin their life in nonprofit venues and end up in on um, Broadway and in commercial settings. And those revenues are very important to theaters for their to provide some sustenance for the on the ongoing life of the theater. But we made a decision at Manhattan Theater Club a number of years ago that really was just reiterating what our basic mission was, is that we're not in the business of trying to produce work for the commercial theater, and that what we do, we choose to do, regardless of what its commercial potential is. So in our budget, we don't build anything in. Um, we project no extensions on our shows. We project no shows moving. We don't count on any. And there was a, a year where we thought, well, of the last 20 years, every year something has moved into another setting and we have received some royalties from a show running. And we decided that that was very foolish from a financial and artistic and moral point of view. So now we don't plan on it. And therefore, I make the choices based on who the people are, what the plays are, and what the material is. Can you exist on your membership, on your subscription, without going outside? With no, it? no. Subscription covers about one half of what it takes to put on the plays in uh -huh. the theater club. So right. that you have to then, in a sense, get money from outside. That goes into funding. But that's, but that's corporate support and mm -hmm. um, individual support. That's really not support from revenues from productions that have moved along. That's, that's a unlike minimal percentage. the commercial, the so-called commercial theater, right. which depends only on their ticket buyers. There is a difference between the two. We tend to forget that. Thing. Well, there is. I mean, uh, Len, you bring up something which is uh, which strikes us all in the nonprofit area too, is uh, that everybody wants to receive the revenues from a hit that has been developed at a nonprofit or regional theater. At the same time, there's the implicit compromise that you will not do a play because of its artistic merit, but because of its commercial merit, and it's a it's a it can be a trap. And it's in, I'm glad you brought that up because it can be a trap. I, I think not only can it be a trap, but in, in my experience, the shows um, that have had the most commercial success have been the ones that we have least expected to have a, a commercial success. That it's really, so you're reminded over and over again to consult your heart and mind and integrity about making your choices, not to try to determine what will be commercial, which is, but that's our mandate. That's a different mandate from making a choice to do a commercial um, work. And uh, that's, why, that's why we're going to individuals and corporations and saying, write us checks to support what this work is. It's important that we, that we do keep those distinctions as the commercial nonprofit theater become more and more married. I, th I think that we can uh, thank a very well-known actor for helping bring about the marriage of the commercial and nonprofit theater, and that's Ronald Reagan. Uh, he he took away a lot of sources of funding uh, and seriously hampered the nonprofit nature of the nonprofit theater. Um, I I love the marriage uh, between the nonprofit and commercial theater. Uh, I've been a great beneficiary of it, and I think uh, a lot of credit is due to people like Lynn and, and the uh, other regional theaters because they really are the producers of today. And that really isn't often said. You know, you go to see a show on Broadway and you see people's names above the title. The producing really happens, the alchemy and the nurturing uh, in these nonprofit settings at Lincoln Center, at the WPA, Manhattan Theater Club, Steppenwolf. <clears throat> and I, I think they deserve enormous credit for that. And, and one aspect that, uh, of that that I like very much, I, I personally favor what we call a poor theater, uh, meaning a theater where money is not a dominating factor, because I think that's where the maximum creativity comes about. Um, and, and, and I think that in that setting, you know, where we're not concerned with huge grosses and huge costs, artists, you know, such as Wendy and, and uh, 
even designers and so on can can really go with their imaginations um, and something can be achieved at a certain cost that then can be transported you know into a commercial setting um, so I, I like the arrangement very much and uh, and I think George described the evolution of it uh, quite superbly. Um. But I think we have to remember that actors and writers and directors have to make a living. Mm -hmm. And very often in the non-commercial theater, they cannot make a living. And I think that has hurt both the nonprofit and the commercial theater enormously. Because what it means is that if you are especially an actor, the only place you can make a living is in movies and television. The training for movies and television is quite different from the training for the theater. When those people come into the theater, very often we see they can't hack it. It's also true for a writer. Uh, you cannot get very many royalties. I mean, Lynn cannot pay you that much. That, that is part of her mandate. So it's very nice to be idealistic about the theater and say, yes, we should do it with as little money as possible. But as a result of that, we have fewer and fewer people working in the theater, as is the title of this series. But isn't that because there's just not enough theater? If, if more opportunities were there, people would have more opportunities to write plays, get plays produced, make royalties. There's just not enough opportunities to get that done. Well, unfortunately, the finances of the theater have become horrendous. So that, that to get something done, nowadays, you can't do it um, in the commercial theater. It is easier to do it in the not-for-profit, but we have to keep in mind this dilemma that a lot of people cannot support themselves working in not-for-profit theater. As a result, I think we've lost a huge amount of creative talent. We, they cannot work in the theater and support themselves, so they have but to they work elsewhere. they come back to the theater. These very people that you talk about from movies that have gone out there in order to make money in order to come back and work in the theater. When their can... agents let them. And again, you yes. can't blame the agents. They're only getting 10 or 15 percent. I mean, I think what's sad to me is there used to be no disparity between great theater, artistic theater, and commercial theater. I think we're all agreed Streetcar Named Desire is a pretty good play. Um, it was a commercial hit in every sense of the word. Well, you know, the thing is that nobody sits down to write a play to either be commercial or to be not-for-profit. I agree. You don't just say, whoopee, <laughs> I'm going to make a three-figure deal on this and it's going to be great. You just don't do that. You sit down to write a play and you write as good a play as you can and the play that, that fills you and wants you to give that time to it. You don't, anyone I know who has sat down to say, I'm going to write a commercial play, this will make a killing, invariably that play is not very good. Uh, I, um, I have a question. Howard, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, maybe I misheard you. Do you mean to say that by doing a show commercially, you automatically mean that it's not somehow uh, artistically significant? No, I said, in fact, the very opposite. I said, what is unfortunate <laughs> is <laughs> At one time in our theater, there was no disparity between something of great artistic quality, like A Streetcar Named Desire, and its commercial viability. Well, don't you think that Angels in America is a, an example of perhaps a potentially great piece of writing that has vast commercial appeal? I only know about Angels in America what I have read in the press. I, have not <laughs> so I, think, I think I must reserve. Not, sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is Coming not from you, I was trying to get an awesome first. statement. Yes. Yes. This, this is not to say that wonderful plays have not been developed. I'm just reminding us that as long as we no longer have a commercial theater, really, we have to be aware that a lot of people can't afford to devote themselves to the theater as they could 50 years ago. Let me also remind you there was a man by the name of David Merrick. Now, if anybody knew what was commercial and what was not, it was probably David Merrick. He produced a lot of stuff through his foundation. Those were the things that he thought were not going to make any money because they were artistic. Very often, those things made money, and the things that he produ produced without the auspices of the foundation did not. So nobody knows. And as Wendy said, nobody, I think no one who is truly of the theater sets out to write a commercial play. For that matter, a producer once told me, when you produce something that your heart is not in, and it doesn't make it, and you've produced it simply because you thought it would make money. You really feel like a whore. 
Yeah. He said, you never, you never know what's going, to, what's going to make it. And at least if you produce something you believe in, even if it fails, you don't feel that you have failed. But Howard, I think you're referring, in talking about streetcar, you're referring, as George indicated, to a time when there was the road that we spoke of and when there weren't theaters in just about every major city across the country. The places like the Mark Taper Forum and Steppenwolf and the Alley and the Arena and Long Wharf and the O'Neill Theater Center did not exist at that time. And I think what happened to the place, to the development of new plays, is that as this regional theater movement developed and as the road itself dried up, we became the home of, the, of new plays. But let's not kid ourselves about actors and, the dis and, and talent in the theater. The discrepancy between commercial theater, nonprofit theater, both of them between television and film is so great that there is a tremendous talent drain. And it isn't, the fact is there's not enough work going on on Broadway to sustain actors. Um, there is, obviously the hope is that there will be more and more and everybody's working for more and more. But I don't think we're looking at Broadway versus not-for-profit. We're looking at the presence of television and film and what that, what those... But there's also another, something in between that, that's not, neither not-for-profit or, or Broadway, and that's what Ben has. The Promenade yeah. Theater, for example, in which you've had, it's, it's certainly, it's a profit theater, is it not? Absolutely. The pro the and yet you've had actors and, and vehicles there that have sustained long runs and have said, I stay here and I'm not going to Broadway. Well, I but there's a reason for that. That's there's a very simple reason. The Promenade, the Lucille Lortel Theater, the Variety Arts Theater are nothing other than alternatives mm -hmm. to commercial producers for long-term open-ended runs where they don't have to spend unspeakable amounts of money in order to take advantage to, of the potential audience masses that are available in New York. So that if you do a play at, uh, you, when you do a play at the Promenade, your downside as versus going to a Broadway theater is approximately one half. Your upside is exactly the same. You can do a motion picture sale, you can send it on the road on a national tour, you can do a any number of opportunities that are provided for as a result of a successful commercial production. There is no economic reason well, other than the receipt of a Tony Award, which we're not entitled to. There's no other real reason to go to Broadway directly if you can take that intermediary step. You can always move a play to Broadway, but at that point it's successful. But your people have made the decision, and very many of your shows have not to be moved. Sure, to why? They don't want to. They don't want to break something that's. They don't want to fix something that's not right. broken. Well, so I, I, believe, I, I believe that a play should always be bigger than the theater it's in, um, and I think there are string quartets and there are symphonies. You know. I think, I think the play must more than fill the space that it's in. Uh, an example of that is Tin Types, which was an exquisite creation. Uh, it was done in a 199 seat theater and, and wrongly was moved to Broadway. Um, and it just failed to reach the back wall. You know. there's, there's one school of thought that if it isn't good enough for Broadway, we'll do it off Broadway. Well, I'm definitely not with that. That doesn't apply anymore. No. It's no, not. Dorothy, you, yeah, I, I agree with you, Ben. I, I think that that's that's changing. Dorothy, you no, started to say that I was addressing the, something else, but that's gone by. But regarding this, um, uh, no one sets out perhaps to write a commercial play, but when they write a play, a play has a life um, where it belongs somewhere, and you put it in the wrong environment. A, pl a play that you write, and you put it in the wrong, and it, it, it disintegrates. And that's part of what Albert was saying, and part of what Ben is saying, is that the, the play that you write uh, has a life of, uh, of a frame for itself. And some of the frames are Broadway, and some of the frames are off-Broadway, and some of the frames start in a smaller place, in a developmental place on the, on the road. If that play doesn't start or is not framed in the appropriate place, that, that play will, will expire. It will not function. It will be in the wrong environment and not work. Uh, I wanted to also, uh, Zakes, you come, uh, you were born in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, did you start at the Market Theater? Or you no, the Market is after. After. Yeah, but, I started off with uh, the rehearsal room with uh, Fugard. I, how, tell us how, just 
for as a point of comparison, how what we are talking about uh, relates to your experience or, or doesn't? How is it different? Well, in, your, in, uh, in the sense of uh, you know going on the road, we spend most of the time going on the road, and being an actor, you also had to carry the sets or build the sets and get your own uh, costumes and organize the whole thing. I think which is why uh, Fugat is always writing, you know, the plays are like four characters, two, three, you know, and he directs sure. sure. the plays, and that's, uh, that's the type of uh, role that I'm used to. You did it all. But also, yeah, but also here in, in, in America, it's very interesting because you, you go on the road, which I did with uh, Master Harold and the boys, and did a bus and, bus and truck. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because of the places you hit. You know, you get to some universities, it's like 5,000 people. Master Harold and the boys, only three actors. <laughs> so you have to play real big, you know, like very, very big to get back there. And I found that very interesting for, for an actor. I mean, you could at least uh, try your little... Uh, Say Lawrence Olivier, uh, <laughs> <laughs> term of playing. Was it a different kind of audience for you when you went into that? Yeah, the audiences are the audiences are different. You know, in the sense that you go to Arkansas, then from Arkansas you move, you go to Mississippi. You know, and the, the, the geography they think uh, they think different. Mm -hmm. Why is he saying that? You know, they tend to talk more. <laughs> than uh, you know, than New York. It's like when we're talking to a movie sometimes when you go into a theater. Mm -hmm. people <clears throat> but also uh, talking about uh, the thing about uh, the actors, you know, living at. Uh, I know a lot of actors in Hollywood who would like to come to New York and do a play, but the thing is, once you haven't done a play for five, ten years, <laughs> it's scary, very scary. For, for, for an actor, so they talk about it a lot, but they, they wouldn't do it. Do you think so, that, though, putting a show on the road, taking a show on the road, do you feel that the audience out there needs to have the affirmation of success attached to it, truthfully, from being here in New York, having a good name of an actor, having a name of a writer that they know? Will they go to see a play just because they heard it was a good play? Or does we it have to in, have something familiar attached? We opened in Chicago and, uh, you know, where the houses were packed and we went to Australia. I mean, Perth, right. that's way, way out there. And we're playing to packed houses and uh, we're back here. So I think if, uh, the Why whole did thing, you go to Australia? Why did we go to Australia? Because yeah. we were still working on that by the piece, but also I think a step in Wolf had a bad deal with uh, her I for the festival. Mm -hmm. But also it, it, it has a long Seattle. way to go for <laughs> a, a yeah, pre-New York opening. You can't get it, about farther away yeah. than Perth. Yeah. 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 But also it, it, no, it helps in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the acting because the people are different, the geography is different. So you, you find other things in the play. It's a constant it's a constant discovery, I think, uh, for actors to go every night on the stage. You have to find something every night and take that shot and take the chance. Sometimes you're going to fall flat, and of course, if you fall flat, you're in big trouble. But that, that's the joy, I think, of uh, doing uh, it. It's pitch. the joy and the terror, all in the same. Uh huh. And having good people like uh, <laughs> Albert and Dasha, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a big help because they're very comforting in that mm. sense. Yeah. Talk yeah, about comforting. <laughs> Talk about yeah. comforting. Howard, I have a question for you. Do you have a different expectation when you review a show on the road or an off-Broadway show than you do when it comes to Broadway? Wonderful and question. what are your standards always, there? I've always wanted to know Please the answer to that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what do you want to know? To begin with, I do not review shows on the road. I don't think any of the New York critics reviews shows if they're coming into New York, because you work on the assumption that they have work to do, and they'll get here and that that is the appropriate time to review them. Well, there are things, though, that you do sometimes, rather than on the road, review out of town without whether or not they're coming, like, let's say, in New Haven or at the Yale Rep or something? No. I think, I think there's a critic that goes to London in order to see shows before they come here. Um, we all sometimes it. go to London for refreshment, and sometimes the shows that we see in London mm -hmm. come here, but I don't think we think of them in terms of pre-Broadway. We think of them as London. I think that when you go into, I think what Albert says is very true. A play should be bigger than its theater rather than smaller. 
I think there is some sense when you go into a Broadway theater, these are, after all, 19th century buildings for the most part, or early 20th century buildings. They have a kind of grandeur, and you expect that what you're going to see in them will fill the house. When you go into a theater off-Broadway, none of Ben's, of course, which are all well-kept up, but some of the theaters off-Broadway are not so well-kept up, you do have different expectations. It doesn't have to be as big a play. However, the... Maybe I should let my your, theaters run down. <laughs> I was just thinking the same your, thing. No, your criteria, or my criteria, are always the same. What are they trying to do? Did they do it? Was it worth the effort? And But, but it's true that you come into a Broadway theater with certain expectations, but it has to do with what Albert said. It has to do with the scale of what's going I think that's true on. of the audience as well. I, I know yes. the audience that goes to off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway, a more acceptive audience, a receptive audience. They're, they're there because they want to be there and they're because they love the theater and they're going to see it. And they expect to enjoy it. Also, the price of Broadway. Yes, and the price price. You haven't made that large an investment. Mm -hmm. When you make an investment well, in Broadway, become, you kind of feel you want it's not something cheap for your money. more on off-Broadway anymore. The ticket prices are going up almost at the same rate as Broadway prices. It's no longer the bargain. But there is a different acceptance of the play off-Broadway of the audience. And I would like to know why that is. I, 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 it's, it's ten, fifteen dollars difference in, in a ticket price. And you might say, well, for two people, that's $30. But it, it doesn't make for all that difference in it. You go to a Broadway theater, and you say you well, expect we've more. We've discovered something very interesting about our three theaters, which I think is applicable to the, to the, to the not-for-profit theaters, to the Manhattan Theater Club and the Roundabout and those theaters, is that the off-Broadway theaters become, in a sense, a little regional theater. The promenade, because of its location, uh, on the Upper West Side, draws people from the Upper West Side, they think of it as the neighborhood theater. The Lucille Hotel Theater draws people from Greenwich Village, downtown, midtown, and it's a neighborhood kind of a feeling, the same with the variety. And we have a, re we have a lot of people who come to the promenade, no matter what's playing there, even though it's not a subscription house because of its location and the fact that it's not just part of the Broadway scene. It's it's up on the Upper West Side. So that's an interesting development that we've discovered. What about other people's money, which is all the way downtown and the uh, main people's money hit a nerve that uh, would have hit any place it had gone. Mm -hmm. it, it spoke to a very large constituency of Manhattan, and they, they came out in big-time support of that play. And that's why the Mineta Lane is on the map. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah. they made the decision to stay there. there were, everybody wanted it to move uptown, and, and they said, no, this is where... I don't the think small the producers theater, ever wanted to move that place. Well, they they didn't. Agree. The producers didn't, but other people came to woo them to move uptown. Oh, that's but possible. they knew what they, the what they should do. That they, but they, that stayed. they stayed where they yeah. were. Absolutely, they well, stayed. the same yeah. thing happened with Driving Miss Daisy, which Absolutely. certainly was yeah. one of the greatest examples. But to and get back... Those are wise decisions to be true. made. But to get back an to... If I just address this, there's an old saw that says it's better to stay at the same house and make a, make a steady living for five or ten years than it is try to move to a larger house and make a killing and die in your first week. Well, I would show a little shop of horrors if there was ever a right. show that should have, that probably could economically have could have moved to Broadway, that was it. I mean, right. that was a huge hit. We, we kept it down there very deliberately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but wearing a hat as a commercial producer and also producing off-Broadway, which truthfully is more fun. Um, I will ask you, Howard, about if a review comes out on a show that is out of town, not, a, you know, not in work, I will go there and I will see seven colleagues all sitting there saying, ah, the show got wonderful reviews. I am here. That is the power of what happens when it, either a show is in London and gets a good review in London or out of town. Now, how do you, as a commercial producer, wanting to do a new play and a new, new property on Broadway, do something without the affirmation of success attached to it, without a review or without a, without a name star in it? Well, again, it's, nowadays a theater you. ticket is a hard sell. <laughs> I always say that one of the biggest problems of the theater is that whereas 30, 40 years ago, you drew on a huge reservoir of theater goers in New York who knew the actors, knew the playwrights, knew sometimes the directors and choreographers. 
regardless of what the, the then seven critics said, they would go to see a play because X was in it, or because Y wrote it, and they had enjoyed Y's last play. The cost is now too great for people to go to the theater simply because they have that love of the theater or love of a writer. Also, I think the number of theater goers has dwindled. And now instead of going to see X or Y, the safest thing is just take a subscription at Lynn's place and go to see what Lynn gives you. So I think that the problem is how to overcome the inertia. Um, the inertia and the cost. It's a big problem. That's why you need this kind of... I think you have to put it the other way around. The cost <laughs> comes well, with the inner the cost. Well, I think I, it's true, but that's why you need, I'm afraid, a star. You need a quote ad. It's a problem. I, I, have, I have a response to what Dasha was saying. Um, my vote, my confidence in my vote is always with the audience. Uh, and, and when we have a play with a run at the Manhattan Theatre Club or the WPA, it's an opportunity to go and listen to the audience. I trust the audience above anything else. Uh, it's one of the reasons that we moved Steel Magnolias from the WPA, which had very mixed reviews. Howard's review was one of the few positive, good reviews that that got. Uh, it, it had two bad reviews from the New York Times. We moved it because I could hear it in the audience. You know, and the, the critics don't even pay. Um. <laughs> There's a Chinese proverb, those in the free seats hiss first. Uh, and, and, and secondly, the critics, the critics can help you for the first six weeks or so. I've had shows that got very fine reviews, and, and that's a very critical time to go and listen to your audience. What are they telling you now that the reviews have come out? They have fine reviews and close within two months because the audience didn't want them. So, so I think, you know, if, you, if you're in a situation where you have something running in a regional or non-profit theater and you go and you listen to the audience, they will tell you, you know, whether you have something or not. And, and Steel Magnolias went on to be uh, huge. a huge hit. Uh, you know, another aspect of Steel Magnolias was that women are the people who decide what, t what shows <laughs> tickets are going to be bought for. Women run the uh, amateur theaters throughout the country. And I knew it was a show that women wanted. And it proved to be true, but we had to hang on for our lives for about 11 weeks. But we did get there, and we stayed there. But Albert, um, to go one step further with this, I agree with you, and I think word of mouth is extremely, extremely important. But with the economics of theater today, it takes time to build that word of mouth. And that is, I think, what we have to address ourselves. The advertising costs on and the budget for, to do a show are so tremendously high and the exposure of the show to tell people to go to see it is something, if you don't have that advanced sale going in when you open a show, how do you build it quickly, the word of mouth, in order to sustain the cost and the budget well, with of the, with, your with, weekly grosses? With budgets that we now have, uh, it's absolutely necessary and responsible to have a, a substantial reserve. Um, when I was a pup, you know, and I did a 12-character musical at Lucille's Theater for $40,000, the reserve would have been probably $7,000. Now, if I was to do the same musical, it might be six or $700,000. And to be responsible, I must build a reserve in of 125, 150000 mm -hmm. which would go toward operating losses uh, and advertising. And how much uh, would that be on Broadway? <laughs> well, uh, we opened Jacob Zulu with a reserve of $400,000. Was budgeted a million four, and we had a reserve of four hundred thousand dollars, and it proved to be a very, I think, uh, good good figure. You know, what, one thing I'd like to say about advertising costs uh, is that the the costs of advertising in the New York Times have increased six hundred percent in the last ten years. Uh, that's well above the cost of living increase. <laughs> Which uh, I want to uh, bring it back to the to the region because Dasha, you you have been. Uh, around the country, and I wish you would give us uh, a little bit of a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a perspective or a, a picture of what's out there, because, uh, you know, uh, of how these things come in, because I know that you've had a marvelous relationship, for instance, with Steppenwolf, but you've been in uh, Louisville and the Humana, but tell us a little bit more what you've seen and how these things have uh, 
evolved for you? Well, I just want to finish with the advertising. I did a little bit of homework yesterday, and I found out that to take an ad, which you might want to know, in the New York Times is $50,000 for one shot for one page in the New York Times, approximately that. To run a commercial, and you have to most... Uh, musicals will run a commercial. It's very difficult to do a straight play as a commercial because what section do you pick out for the audience to respond to? But a commercial for a musical, just to shoot the, not, not the airing, but to shoot the spot is approximately $200,000 and forty to $50,000 a week to air it. And that has to be incorporated into the budget. So you see where that takes a tremendous amount of money in producing a show, your top, your top, co uh, top costs. Is and um, I think to answer your question, George. I'm, I want, well, I'm going to stay on your question. Um, we're talking about cost, and we're also talking about reviews. Before we get to Louisville, has it ever been suggested that the reviewers, the New York reviewers for the Broadway theater, withhold their reviews for two days, three days, so that there is a time for word of mouth to get around? Very often. Well, to begin with, it's not as it was in the old days, where even if a show was out of town, it came to New York, it gave two performances, and then it opened. Now, very often, a Broadway show will be in previews for weeks. Mm -hmm. So that is the opportunity for word of mouth to get around. I think, unfortunately, they don't want us to hold, unless they really know it's a turkey. I mean, there have been musicals that have run and run and run without setting an opening date. But more often than not, they want the reviews because they assume that that will give them the publicity. And of course, they assume that what they've done is brilliant. So they assume that on the basis of those reviews, there will be a line at the box office at the next morning. I wonder if that, if there couldn't be a discussion on I don't think anyone assumes that. that anymore. I yeah. have to disagree with you, yeah. Howard. No one yeah. assumes that after the day after the reviews come out, we're going to have lines at the off-Broadway box offices. We have meetings ad nauseum mm. about marketing mm. and about strategies, and we assume yeah. the reviews are going to be bad. Well, but I think what, I don't know that you should assume that the reviews are going to be bad. But I think you cannot think of us as a sales tool. We don't. I don't think we do. Well, that's very healthy. You, you have time for a word of mouth. Where but that's the, because the in England you still... doesn't come out the very following morning. Everybody's like, oh, what is The daily it? reviews do come out the following morning. But again, in England, you still have a large re reservoir of theater goers who go regardless of the reviews. There, there is... Uh, I, I, just, I just have to leap in with a bit of trivia. There is one show that made millions and millions of dollars and never came into New York because no one ever dared open it here. Uh, but most of you are not old enough to know, but it's a thing with June Wilkinson called Pajama Tops. And that made there's a similar show. show. What's that thing in Sheer Man? Sheer Man. Sheer Sheer Man. Sheer Man. Yeah, it never came in because everybody matter? they were going to be killed. And it, somewhere in the world, pajama chops are still around. Um, Lawrence and Lee wrote a play called The Night Thoreau Spent oh, in Jail. That, 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 that has been yeah, that has been around yes, the country yeah. for it's twenty played years. Played all over the world, every single yeah. Yeah. night it plays someplace. Yeah. But again, marketing is deal. very important yeah. to the theater. All right, now Louisville. Yeah, no, Louisville Slugger. Well. I think Louisville and the O'Neill are two extremely, extremely important spots for authors, for directors, for actors to have a showcase to, for, for producers, for television people, for film people to go down to see what is happening. And I think a lot of the new programs without people hovering over you, looking to see what you're doing, it is an extremely valuable experience. I worked with George up at the O'Neill on a play that is still being worked on, and it was two, three years ago. And the luxury that one has of freedom, as Wendy said, of being able to really concentrate on what you're doing is just the most valuable, valuable asset, I think, in the theater. Um, as far as costs are concerned, well, of course, funding is, of course, they do not get a tremendous any amount of money, be Louisville and uh, George, from audiences. You have to take a subscription to go down there. You, you buy the ticket. They have this one. I'm talking about the Louisville Festival, where a group of new plays are presented. But it is the most incredible showcase. And I think that is what, George, certainly it's in your field. It's similarly what you both do together. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, we are, our our ticket price is seven dollars top, <coughs> except on weekends we may go to eight uh, uh, because we we can't make it off the box office, and we're, we're there to, to try to find the voice. You know, you're and, ahead and, of the game because the airfare down in Louisville is more expensive. That's right, exactly. <laughs> and and geography is right. We're far enough away from New York, but not and near enough so that people are we're accessible that way. Uh, but uh, it's interesting and it's and it's frightening. Uh, I, I will say uh, one of my other hats is uh, uh, I am on the National Council of the Arts, and uh, as we again talked, uh, the theater program at the National Endowment uh, has lost 35 percent of its funding, mm -hmm. even though the funding has stayed even uh, for the National Endowment. The theater program within it has shrunk for a lot of reasons. That is, is a whole series of uh, another seminars, but it's interesting that we're all hit with that. Uh, and being savaged in, in, in all kinds of different directions uh, in terms of funding. So it's hard to keep the ball in the air, and prices don't stay even, even though the funding may stay even. It's a, it's a very, very tough uh, call nowadays for that. But you see, you, if you look around and you see the theaters, uh, the shows that are in uh, New York right now, uh, Redwood Curtain, for instance, uh, came in, uh, came out of the regional theater. Uh, Angels in America that is coming in has evolved. Uh, you know, Jacob Zulu uh, has come uh, out of, of, of the only about the, one of the few that that actually started right here and evolved. Right here is uh, well, even even you know, even Sisters really, if you look at it, uh, was was here and uh, but evolved here. I'm, I'm just thinking, Full Moon is one of the few that just really sort of started. They were out in Seattle right after but, me. In that's the right, same just fooling around with that. Progress. Yeah, they yeah. were the, the working on their show. Yes, yeah, we left and they came. Yeah, uh, so. Same time. Mm -hmm. so. But hand, how do you handle shows, and how do you go about if you see something? And I know you do a lot with Apron when you go over to London. Do you have, let's call it a liaison or a merger or some type of a program that also enhances? your ability to bring in the show or for them to do something such as pap and uh and the court theater used to do um well we don't have any uh, official um relationships but um and in fact i've never seen um i've never seen an alan Akeborn play that i've directed or produced so it's really there are plays that i read and then i have i know alan because i've gone to meet with him and gone to his theater but um, I travel to London and I see works there and have relationships with many writers. But it, I think the relationships really came from reading plays and making decisions that we would produce the plays early on. Could um, we talk more about that? We're going to have to take a break right now. And everybody stand up, stretch, or do whatever it is that you want to do, and then sit right down again. And we'll continue this discussion. I'm sorry to do this. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Don't go far away. This is CUNY TV, Channel 75. We're continuing the American Theatre Wing Seminar on Working in the Theatre, which is coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And this seminar is on the development of plays, the importance of regional theatre off-Broadway onto Broadway. And here to discuss that are representatives of practically every part of the theatre, and the importance of this development, bringing the plays to the work that's in the theater. And so Dash Epstein will continue along with George White as moderators and go on with your questioning. Dasha. Well, when we sat down here, someone came up to me and said, what do you hear about angels in America? Okay. Now, I think all of us here certainly know that we've read about it and we've heard about it and in every single form. And Howard, I don't want to go back to you all the time, but I must say that when we say that a show has not been really reviewed out of town, it was reviewed in England. It was reviewed at the Taper in, Lo in Los Angeles. There has never, in my recollection, been as much hype about a show before a show opens in New York on Broadway. Now, the Times newspaper has gotten behind it, and in a way it has indeed whether it's subliminally or not, supported this show 
It has certainly gotten the Pulitzer, which is wonderful. I saw the show in London. I did not see it, in, in, and I, it is a good show in my estimation, but I could not say to everybody, you must see the show. Why has this tremendous <coughs> surge, and, and it is hyped. It has really been hyped. Well, and is that an is that an uh, is that good for the show? Bad for the show? How will you respond? How how will people respond? It's also P.S. going to be very difficult. Maybe it isn't because I mean I know you. I know he's your critic. But you're going there to try to be objective, and you will be with all of that. It's going to be hard to go there fresh. Absolutely the true. Uh, let's let's say this: oh, an enormous number of things that are now on Broadway have come in with tremendous hypes. They tend to be musicals rather than plays. This is the first non-musical that has received this kind of hype. I think the reason it has received this Can kind of hype... Can you use another word instead of hype? Ballyhoo. This is the... <laughs> <laughs> advanced publicity. I think advanced publicity. Right. I like At any that rate, bit. partly this is a political event. It is related to the self-affirmation of gays in America. I think you cannot dissociate it from that. It's not just that here is a wonderful play that everybody thinks we should get behind. It, is, it has become a political event, so that I think you almost have to look at it in two senses. You have to see what it means as a political statement and then what it means as a piece of theater. But I think that is why it has generated this amount of hoopla. <laughs> um, it is admittedly not going to be easy to look at it with a fresh eye, because I can't think of any play that I have ever seen where I knew as much about it before I went in. Mm -hmm. But if ever there was an example of what this seminar is about, of the development of a play in regional theater, in university, in off-Broadway, Angels is the epitome of that. Absolutely. Because it, and, I, and I think we would, would you like to, to describe how it got to Broadway? Does anybody here? No, but I think we must remember what the, the crowning moment was when it was in London. Mm -hmm. um, at last year's Tony broadcast, Ian McKellen said, I just saw a play that's going to win all the Tonys next year. And then the Times shortly afterward gave it its imprimatur. Mm -hmm. So had it, I think it was originally done in San Francisco. Then it went to London. That's Had it right. been done in San Francisco and then right. say Seattle, oh. I'm not sure that the same thing would have happened. But it started it's also in San developed Francisco in a small the theater. The theater was directed by Oscar Eustace. Uh, then there was a London production. Uh, Lynn and I happened to attend the same mm -hmm. evening. Uh, we got asked to leave Joe Allen's because we didn't want food. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Joe Allen's in London. In London. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was done in London, and Frank Rich saw it over there uh, and gave it a superlative review. It was then done at the Mark Taper Forum last fall uh, in, in yet another production. Each production had a different director, except that uh, Oscar Eustace was the co-director of the production last fall at the Mark Taper. Um, that, Frank however, Rich, the, that, that, however, had two parts to it that had the, yes, both that parts was, for the first time. Instead of three and a half hours, it was seven hours. Right. Um, it, uh, Frank Rich saw that production uh, and gave it a superlative review once again, but his radio review, there was a little tip in there. Uh, this production is not good enough to come into New York. I hope that whoever the creators and producers are will take another look. Um, so if you were listening to the radio, and I'm sure they were, they did, uh, and we're going to have yet a new production with a new design team um, and George C. Wolfe at the helm. The reason I know so much about this is because I was one of the independent producers who was pursuing it, um, and I, I aligned myself with the Schubert organization with whom I have a relationship, and it went to the Jew Jansen, so I was out. Well, I tried to get it for Off-Broadway, but they didn't want to know from me. <laughs> but, you know, we, go, we, 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 we can't avoid the, uh, the issue here of, of the, when we, we're talking about the... Uh, the, the uh, power of, 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 in a sense, the times in this, in this equation here in terms of encouraging people to go get the play. Again, I remember, uh, we, I talked earlier at the beginning about the road, and uh, uh, in, in the early days of the road, or when I grew growing up, I remember working for a television producer who also was interested in either acquiring properties for television or for, for uh, the theater, um, who... Every uh, so often would would 
run into my office and say, I need Elliot Norton's review in Boston. I need Harold Bone's Variety review from, uh, from New Haven and Ernie Shear's review in the Philadelphia Bulletin. And that was what drove the machinery to understand whether or not you were going to go, on go beyond. Those, those were the, I, I, I don't think I've missed any, but those are the basic one. Elliot Norton, mm -hmm. uh, Bone yeah. of Variety, and Ernie Shear of, of the Bulletin were the three major out-of-town critics that had a great deal of influence on what came in. But now, George, I have a question. Is, I mean, I would hate to think that the reason why Angels in America has gotten all this energy behind it is because of Frank Rich's accolades. Isn't it a little bit chicken in the egg? I mean, it's a great well, play, sure. therefore it draws out this kind of stuff, and therefore it moves forward on its own momentum. That's well, the he, he was the That's catalyst. The yeah, but he was it's not because of him. It's a great piece he, of work. He aroused people's, people's interest, and they went and I think made their own conclusions. And in every move, it, it was acclaimed. I'm, well, fa I'm thankful that he yeah. sparked yeah. the interest in Wendy, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to ask you, as a playwright, and if you had your druthers, <laughs> and you care about the theater, which obviously you do because you write for it, what would you like to see happen in the theater? How could you get more people going to the theater? What kind of theater would bring more people? Wow. You mean like if I had a wand and if you just had this? What would you do? <laughs> yeah, you think I want it? Everybody, when you ask anyone, they say, I love the theater. You know what, I it, wish I, I could go to the theater back more back often. A little bit to what Howard was saying about people making a living in the theater. I know I once had lunch with, I, once, I, I often have lunch with Jerry Zaks. <laughs> <laughs> and Jerry Zaks and I were both saying, if we could, and Jerry's in a position now, I think that he can, one would like to have some people would like to work just in the theater, you know, just do plays, just direct plays, just write plays, actually not do movies and television. They are not, to some playwrights, some directors, as innately interesting. The problem is, is what Howard was saying, making a living and staying in the theater. What's great about the developmental process is if it's on a track like Angels in America or what happily happened with the Sisters Rosenzweig, it's developed, it's done in another arena, it's done on Broadway, something happens. What happens to a lot of playwrights is they get stuck into like development hell, which is like voicemail. And you're, <laughs> you're, you're stuck there developing your play at theater after theater and taking notes from, you know, dramaturg after dramaturg. It's like being in progressive school the rest of your life and you're a grown up, you know? So if it leads you somewhere, what's fabulous about the O'Neill Center where Uncommon Women was done, and also I used to be their delivery girl with the scripts, <laughs> is that, um, a play is, you know, it's worked on seriously as a play, it's developed, but you also meet Lynn Meadow there, but you also, I remember I met Joe Papp there. You begin the professional working life of a playwright, which is to write, which is to develop, and, also and then you're to pushed have your out. Plays produced. You must have. I remember when I was in drama school, they taught us about the first woman playwright, someone named Hiroz Vita of Gaversham, <laughs> who was a ninth century nun who wrote like over 200 plays that were never, <laughs> never produced. She was a closet dramatist. It was so depressing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, All right? Paulus and Terence rewrites. Exactly. But you know, you I've want to make a living in this art form, and what you also want is to have it part of people's lives, people coming to the theater, not just for an anniversary. Um, I think what is great about Broadway theater is that you get a cross-section of people who coming to plays for very different reasons. It's not just an intelligentsia that's coming to the theater. You get some intelligentsia, some people, businessmen on holiday, some families. That's good because theater, it should be all part of their lives. I just saw the importance of being earnest in London, the Maggie Smith production. And when the curtain came down, the last, as the last line was said, the entire audience repeated the line. <laughs> and you could tell it was just in their guts. Yeah, and there was a family in, in a box and with a little girl there, and I thought, this is the first time she's going to see this play. She will see this play the rest of her life, and she'll be able to repeat the last line. It's like, if I could wish anything, and I, I don't know how to do it because I'm not a producer, but you want it, the theater to be integral to the culture. You want it to be the soul of the culture. And what's great about Angels in America, I think, is that it is integral to our culture right now. And that makes it an important play. And I think even what makes me happiest about the Sisters Rosenzweig, frankly, 
is if you went into Disney Pictures and said, I want to make a movie with three women over 40, and guess what? The romantic lead is 54. They'd say, thanks, honey. Do you have any ideas for animation? But, <laughs> but you can do that. You can have that idea in the theater because it's an individual artist. And maybe four years from now, it will seep down into the culture, and they will have women over 40s in movies. I hope so. But it's that. It's that it would become that important to us again. But I don't know how you do that. Well, you know, I, I think okay. it is becoming. I think it is. I think an audience is coming back. I think they're coming back from the restaurants and, 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 and coming into the theater again. I, and I, maybe I'm whistling Dixie, but I, I, I really feel that there's well, that's great. more audience coming in now. I, I also feel that what Wendy said is 100% right, and certainly she cannot, I cannot phrase it half as well as she can, but I think that there's a very important word called familiar. And people like to feel familiar with the subject, familiar with what Wendy has written, familiar, they've read a lot about AIDS and about what is happening here. So there is a familiar, they know, they know the importance of being earnest. They're familiar with Maggie Smith. So there is a familiarity that attracts people to say, if I'm spending this amount of money, I want to know a little bit about it. I want to know if the critic said something good about it. There is the still the connection of an affirmation with the product. Yes, but then there's also, I, I find a lot of my friends going to theater that I've recommended, and then they've enjoyed it, and they've said very apologetically to me, I enjoyed it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> surprise, surprise. You know, because I wasn't supposed to. The critics said it wasn't good, but, but I enjoyed Part of it. it. I think is starting, uh, starting um, uh, people. I love the the example that uh, Wendy is using because I think part of it is getting uh, young people to come to the theater mm -hmm. as part of an experience. Um, uh, so many. People are frightened of the theater. They they think, how do you behave yeah. there? It, it requires yeah. something special. We have to. It's an event. It's not an everyday That's situation. That's why the, the program that we're doing on, on this and introduction to say. Broadway is they just that, and they're not coming scared to death. They're coming right. now as a part of their lives to see it, so to well, see that they I, can come to Broadway and wonderful. come to a theater. And, and, and that's what's needed, not for the anniversary right. or the birthday exactly. or the Exactly, and I think the programs that But then we have doing. to go back to the price of the ticket again. Well, yes, if I had a magic wand, for. I would wave it over the ticket well, price. you know, there, there is, a, there is as, as Sarah, as we Me were all too. saying, too, there's something, there are a couple of, of quick <laughs> anecdotes and things that I, I want to bring up. One has to do with regional theater, and part of the, is as is, is, is prevalent in regional theater is this, vis-a-vis -vis Broadway. Uh, I have a friend who uh, used to work at the Hartford Stage Company, um, who uh, lived in a, a very nice apartment house uh, with his wife and once went to the landlord. Uh, uh, they were very friendly and the landlord said once to him, you know, I would like to go to see one of your shows sometime. And this fellow said, sure, whenever you want, I'll, give, I'll get you two tickets, I get comps and I'll give you two tickets. What night do you want to go? This is the landlord. This is an average middle class guy. And he blushed and he said, Oh, I, I, I can't. And Chuck said, Why? He said, Well, you see, I, I don't have a tuxedo. <laughs> now, that is not, you know, that, that is a, a person. Perception. That is the perception that perception. you've got. It's something you dress up for. You're dealing with, yes, I agree 100% about ticket prices, but there's also perception. I think it's actually easier in Broadway because of the programs that the Wings doing that's broken that down. But in certain areas, the theater is perceived as something, you know, that, that's one quickly. The other thing is in Russia, where I spent a great deal of time, the theater is your forum for ideas, and everybody goes. And, and, and the reviews, P.S., come out two or three months later because everybody as soon as something opens everybody wants to go see it because it's the forum for ideas and the third thing relates to to the history of the guthrie theater which is sort of sad uh and that is that when the guthrie opened and as it evolved until about 10 years ago it was the one place in this country where actors felt they could really live like real people they could have mortgages they could have families they could have houses they would always be in point it was a real company and, and they didn't care about doing film or, fel or television. Yes, they did some, maybe some commercials in the Twin Cities, but that's it. And that fell away because the, in the nature of the evolution, people said, well, companies anymore. And it undercut and it began to bring in stars, mm -hmm. so-called. And it undercut the sense of real family that was really something going that could have made actors grown-ups. And it didn't happen. It's tragic. Does Seattle have the same reputation in Seattle as it has here in New York? 
Yeah, I mean, Seattle's a wonderful theater town. There's like, what, 30 theaters in Seattle? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are apparently more yeah. equity actors in Seattle than any American city except New York and Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. The word in Los Angeles is, go to Seattle, there's work there. Yes, and also, Why it's a tremendously that? sophisticated audience. I was there mm -hmm. for the opening of the Seattle Repertory Theater. I was very thrilled by the audience there, because mm -hmm. I felt it was an audience you, that was listening you, to the play. Can you say why that is so? No, I don't why know. Why is no. Seattle it's, so unique? It just is a city with obviously a large middle class at mm -hmm. that time. Um, many of them ex-New Yorkers, I gathered, people who cared about the theater, but people who feel very comfortable in does the theater. The, does the city administration do anything for the theater? I suppose I was, the very, there, I was very impressed by the fact that they had raised a lot of money to build this beautiful new theater. And I've now forgotten the name of the man for whom it was named, and I'm embarrassed about this because I was very touched. All these people contributed each a million dollars on the understanding that it would be named for this person because they felt that he was the spearhead. That's a kind of yeah. selflessness mm. that we well, think of as of part of the theater, but you don't see a lot of well, it. There, there is a reason, too, how that's absolutely Seattle and Minneapolis earlier, it's why Tony Guthrie got involved. Yes. It, it's part demographics and part of these cities who, which are encompassable and cities that work. Uh, they, they're easy, they, they somehow work as cities. Uh, and they also are the centers of, a, of major multinational corporations. So that they, I mean, Minneapolis, we forget, is this, there are many, and so is Seattle. You've got yes. Boeing, which almost went under, right. and the Esprit de Corps to get it back so that people could work. It was an economic, it's an interesting economic uh, tie-in, tie which unfortunately the city of New York administration never understands. No. If, if, the, if the theaters in this city were dark for a week, uh, the, this, this place would go crazy, or, and all the cultural institutions in the city were dark for a week, you would find an enormous, suddenly people, the, the, city the whole economy would of say, the city would go. Well, the whole economy would go under, and mm -hmm. nobody understands that. No. Let me say one more thing in relation to what Wendy said, which I have been saying for years and I think is terribly important. The play that you saw that thrilled the audience so much was The Importance of Being Earnest. It is one of the great plays of you know, world theater. It is also one of the most, if it's done well, one of the most entertaining plays ever written. I have often said, let me quote Chairman Mao, who doesn't get <laughs> quoted as much as you are. Chairman Mao used to talk about walking on two legs, by which he meant for example, medical students. They had to learn all of modern medicine. They also had to learn ancient Chinese herbal medicine. In New York, we've always had a theater that was based on contemporary topics, modern medicine. We've never really had a substantial classical theater. I think that has been an enormous disadvantage to us. That's why when you go to London, very often the new plays you see there are not more remarkable than our new plays. But you can always see a great production of Shakespeare, a great production of Chekhov. It reminds you of what the theater is, what the potential of the theater is. Because by and large, the classics in New York have been done extremely shabbily. We have been allowed to forget the potential of the theater. And I think that is another thing that has killed the audience off. There is always an audience for a good production of the importance of being earnest. How do, how do we go back to remember? What would be your suggestion? The same. There are wish people who know how to do it. I would say what? someone what would earlier someone us? mentioned Hartford Stage. Mark Lamos is a man who knows how to do the classics in a way that they seem themselves. He doesn't modify them in a way to pander to an audience, but he also makes them seem very fresh. It was very crazy. A couple of years ago, we all trooped up to see two parts of Per Gint. Um, everybody came away with a new love for Per Gint. For that matter, a couple of years ago, Ingmar Bergman did several plays in Swedish at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. One of those plays was Miss Julie, a play that I've never really cared for. I thought Miss Julie was great. A production of The Doll's House, which was a great production of The Doll's House. There are people who know how to do these. I'm told that Garland Wright at the Guthrie knows how to do yeah. these things. In New York, unfortunately, we've suffered from a kind of trendyism. And as a result, we've watered down the classics in a way. I'm not saying that everything has to be done just so, but I think there's been an enormous amount of ignorance connected with, especially Shakespeare production. The panel and each one give you an idea, a quick, of what you would like to see in the theater happen. Dorothy? Oh, without a doubt, lower prices. Two sentences. Lower pr two words. 
lower prices. Okay. People will come to the theater if the price is right, and they're willing to take a chance, a chance. if the price is right, okay. but not at the prices that they are. Ben? I would want to reinvent the economics so that the amount of work that was capable of being done was just automatically uh, available and growing, because it's a shrinking industry now. Mm -hmm. Lower ticket prices. Dasha? Ticket prices in a younger audience, an audience that's appreciative and uh, willing, willing to take a bit of a chance, because they're the audience <coughs> that we really have to get to. Um, a place where, where uh, failure is considered uh, a success, where people are allowed to fail uh, and, and, and uh, uh, given the credit for doing so, rather than the blame. Randy? I think a viable alternative to Los Angeles movies and <laughs> television. <laughs> okay. More pays for uh, the actors. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see every Broadway theater lit up with new plays, revivals, and I'd like to see 20 more theaters like Manhattan Theater Club. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Now that's my question, so now would you like to ask a question? Hi, my name's Christine. This was for anyone on the panel that could answer. You mentioned before Angels in America had opened in San Francisco and then went to London. Who makes that decision where the play will go? Like, why wouldn't it stay in the States? Or The yes. author and his agent. Yeah. And how was that decided? I mean, I there... wasn't present. No. <laughs> It was done at the National Theatre of Great Britain. What? Wendy, would you object if the National Theatre of Great Britain offered to do your play? I wouldn't have fight. So. No, that's, <laughs> part of, uh, that's part of it. It's not only the agent and the author, but it's the offers that they get that they select from. If there are no offers, there's nothing to select from. Then they decide when they have the, the list in front of them, let's go to the National in London. Why not? It's great. And I was fascinated to learn about a dozen years ago that you can make a living as a dramaturg working for regional theaters. More people make livings as dramaturgs than as playwrights because there are no, not necessarily grants for playwrights, but there are grants for dramaturgs. And I asked how do the dramaturgs go about selecting the plays? They don't really do that. The agents play them off against one another. In other words, they'll tell Lynn's dramaturg, you may have this play, but you'll get a smaller percentage. I mean, this is, I'm told, the way it's done. I'm not convinced that it is I the see. way it's done. Um, I'm, I shouldn't have used Lynn yeah. as an example, but there, there is a complicated apparatus. But there is a growing power of dramaturgs that, uh, that's getting, in, getting between the playwright and the... We don't have dramaturgs off uh, in the commercial theater. We, that's not, not part of our arena. Our producer. That's a that's a that's a different concept for a regional right. or not-for-profit theater. Isn't that a new part of the of the business that's been added? The drama Absolutely, I think it is. Absolutely, and it comes from the regional theater concept that there is this 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 um, um, Person. guru. Yeah. There's a guru who sits who's <laughs> literary, and who makes those recommendations and who does the reading of the plays selects them, and this is how I see it as a commercial person, reads all of the material and says, good, bad, good, bad, yeah. lines up all the good ones and says, here, Lynn, here's a bunch of good ones. I recommend them in the following order. And I'm supposed to be um, some, sort, some sort of an expert that is to be listened to. In the commercial theater, it's the producer who uh, has the, uh, the smarts and, the, and makes the selection and stands by that selection and puts, raises the money first of all, believes in the product and goes out and does whatever is necessary to bring that product to life. And while someone may say, gee, that's a good show, it is the producer's decision alone and solely. Well, there is, uh, there is a, uh, the, uh, the history of that, too, is that, that it really is a regional theater's intellectual conceit because really the, 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 the nature of dramaturg was invented by Bertolt Brecht, primarily. It was a name that he came up with, and it had to do with a way of functioning within the Berliner Ensemble that was a name that was co-opted by someone who shall be nameless, who took this and and started the process for the regional theater movement. Did this sort of but keep him less, off the hook? Perhaps a less jaundiced view is that um, theaters, as we've talked about today, and there's like Manhattan Theater Club, receive an excess of 1,200 scripts in, right. in a season. You have to have some way and to And there are that. people who assist in the reading, and it certainly is not the case that the only 
plays that I request to read are the ones that people give great reports to. Sometimes it's the ones that people have the worst possible things to say that I know are really going to be the best plays that we end up it doing. Really the plays that are, that are controversial, the plays that, that provoke people. So it really depends on the theater. And I think that, that you can live in, as Wendy said, the hell of being in development permanently, working only with dramaturgs. But it's, it's a very viable function in a theater that has um, many responsibilities and is producing more than one thing at a time also, and is looking for various types of material. I think this is a, a discussion that's a whole other thing. Uh, that I mean, I hope this, uh, this discussion will go on the road, Dr. Sondheim, because uh, it <laughs> is, I, we're just dying. Could I ask that you all come back so we can develop this seminar again and more and more because we've run out of time oh and it, I can't believe it but we, we don't even have time for all the questions that one have been asked you've been such a wonderful group of panelists and you, you've just helped us so much in, in your observations and in your caring and I have to say that this is the American Theatre Wing seminar on working in the theatre and this seminar was on new play development the regional theatre and the cast that's been assembled here today has been extraordinary. And I thank them and I thank you. The seminars are coming to you as part of the WINGS programs. And they are coming from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Thank you very much for being here. Such an and he designed designers that can really can roll with gadget their mission. They 